The grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning. morning. And welcome home to Presby Unity Presbyterian Church. We extend a special welcome to our guests and visitors and invite everyone, visitors and members, to sign the red friendship cards you'll find at the end of your pews. Just to remind you all, Session has called our annual congregational and corporational meeting for Sunday, January 28th, immediately after worship. Be sure to be here to exercise your membership, privilege as a member. Please pay close attention to your bulletin and newsletters this next few weeks. We are heading into a really busy time of year here at the Unity. We will have Scouts Sunday, February 4th, and they will be serving a spaghetti dinner after worship. Then Lent begins on February 14th with our soup and bread dinner, followed by our Ash Wednesday worship. Bingo. Night will take a place on Friday, February 23rd, and as soon as on, lot to put on your calendars. Please, are there any announcements we need to make at this time? I will share very quickly that you will find, if I can get my mic on here, uh, that you will find order forms for our youth group sub-sale uh, around in places, uh, somewhere out there, uh, but... Uh, the <laughs> Those, uh, we'll be taking orders for those over the next couple of weeks, 
and those subs will be ready for Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, all the proceeds will go to support our youth group and youth programs. So uh, buy lots of sandwiches. Uh, also, I want to make sure to invite you all to uh, our Bible study on Thursdays at 10.30 in the morning at Fe in Fellowship Hall here. Uh, we are doing a comparison of the four Gospels. The two sessions that we've done so far, we've looked at uh, the birth narratives, the introductions and beginnings of each of the Gospels, Jesus' calling of the first disciples, uh, Jesus' resurrection and post-resurrection appearances in the four Gospels, uh, and we're going to continue looking at significant uh, themes and stories and teachings. Uh, this coming week, if I remember right, we're looking at uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount and where and how those teachings appear uh, in the Gospels that aren't Matthew's, where the Sermon on the Mount uh, appears. So, very, very interesting, very enlightening. We would love to have you join us Thursdays at 10.30 here. I think that's probably everything I... Oh, uh, also with Ash Wednesday looming uh, on Valentine's Day in just a couple of weeks, uh, we do have our 7 p.m. service. Uh, I will also have the sanctuary open throughout the day, starting pretty early in the morning, uh, so that you can drop in. Uh, there will be you know, self-guided prayer and devotion, uh, and I can impose ashes on you at any time during the day that you want to drop by. Uh, so there is that ongoing, as well as the more formal service at 7 p.m., which will include imposition of ashes. Thank you. Are there any more announcements? Please stand now as you are able for our call to worship, then remain standing for our first hymn. Today we are all called to be disciples, which is found on your page 757 in your hymnal. Jesus call us to practice. Jesus call us to praise and prayer, to song and silence. Jesus calls us to worship. Jesus call us to hearing and healing, to service and solidarity. Jesus calls us to love. Jesus call us to advocacy and action, to protest and provision. Jesus calls us to justice. Let us follow the call of Christ. Let us worship together with joy. Today we all are called.
Please join me for a prayer of confession. Forgiving, Forgiving God, God, we, we repent, repent of all the ways we turn from you. You, you call, but, but we do not listen. listen. You show us your path, but we go our own way. Forgive, Forgive us, heal us, and lead us back to you, that we might share your grace with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Children of God, God's mercy abounds, forgiving us, restoring us, and setting us on right paths of justice and peace. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, loved, and freed. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. And now, as people forgiven and reconciled to God through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, let us forgive and be reconciled with one another as we share the peace we have found in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us exchange signs of peace with our neighbors. Invite our children to come forward. Lots of energy this morning. More than me. All right. It is a net, right? What what can you do with a net? You can catch fish with it. Jerry? You can make a trap with it. You can do what? This is, I'm sorry. Catch a sea monster with it. You could do that too. Yeah, you can catch all kinds of things with a net, right? Clara? Alligators? It might be hard to catch an alligator with a net. They're pretty strong. It'd have to be a strong, strong net. Um, so. We, we're going to talk today about, we're going to talk about Jesus, and Jesus, call, or Jesus calling his helpers. Do you remember what his helpers were called? His disciples, right? So Jesus called some of his disciples, they were fishermen. <laughs> well, I'm not going to catch you. Yes. So th they, are, um, they were fishermen. So they would go out into the Sea of Galilee and they would fish with their nets. Do you think fishing is an easy job or a hard job? 
a very hard job, right? Because if you get a, a whole gigantic net full of fish, the nets were bigger than this, you get it and then you have to pull it up into the boat. It's pretty hard work, right? Yeah. They did their fishing at night mostly so that the fish couldn't see the nets. And then in the mornings they would go and they would look at their nets. They would take, they would sell their catch, look at their nets, and then they would fix anything that was happened, anything that was broken in their nets. So Jesus came to these, these fishermen and he said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, Emma, do you think he was meant they were going to take their nets and they were going to catch they were going to catch people with them? Is that what they meant? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's not what he meant though, right? He meant he would We're going to feel it. We can feel it when we go back. Um, we um, he used he used something that they understood again. He explained things in a way that they would understand. He was wanted them to go out and help him bring other people and tell him about God and about Jesus. All right, let's um, do our echo prayer. Dear God, help us to be fishers of men for you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Please join me in prayer of illumination. Holy One, pour out your spirit upon us that we may hear your word and respond faithfully to it. Tell us what we need to hear and show us what we need to do. 
to follow Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Bible quotation is taken from the Old Testament reading from book of Jonah, Jonah 3, 1 to 5, and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to the Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city. A three days walk across, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaim a fast, and everyone, great and small, but on a sackcloth. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did do it. The word of the Lord. We'll affirm our faith this morning using the ancient and ecumenical words of the Apostles' Creed. So please rise as you are able as we profess the faith that we share. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Good News According to Mark, the first chapter, verses 14 through 20. Je we don't actually hear Jesus' birth narrated in Mark's gospel, but Jesus has already been baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist, and immediately he was led out into the wilderness to be tempted, uh, and he spent 40 days there. We will return to that reading in a few weeks at the beginning of Lent. And here we hear the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So let us listen together for a word from God. Now, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. None of the call stories in the Bible, and we compared all four of them this past week in Bible study, none of the call stories in the Bible include the moment when the called person goes to their loved ones, their parents, significant others, spouses, children, and tells them that they're leaving to go do something, 
because a guy walking on the beach told them to follow him. This part of the story isn't in the Bible because it would probably make it really hard to convince people to do this whole discipleship thing. This part of the story would undoubtedly involve a lot of yelling, crying, and words most preachers, not me, would have a hard time saying in church. When you think about what and who these first disciples gave up and left behind, when you think about how those conversations would likely have gone, it's a wonder that anyone would follow this Jesus guy. The stories of the disciples' families and loved ones aren't in the Bible. All we have are the sentences in verses 18 and 20 in what we read today. Andrew and Simon immediately left their nets and followed him. James and John left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. These four fishermen left their nets and their boats, their families and their loved ones, everything they knew behind to follow the strange call of Jesus. Picture these empty nets lying in the sand, abandoned, except for footsteps leading away from them. Think about everything that these nets meant to the men who walked away from them. These nets were Simon, Andrew, James, and John's livelihoods. Nets filled with fish meant that they and their families would eat today. Maybe they would even have enough left to sell or trade for luxuries like clothing or oil for their lamps. These nets were security for their families. But fishing was more than just their job or a way to make their ends meet. Fishing was their identity. These were fishermen. These weren't weekend warriors or Seasonal workers who went where the cash crops were, out on the waves just to make a buck or to drink a few beers and maybe do some fishing on the weekend. These were fishermen, as were their fathers before them. Old Zebedee, even though he had two young, strong sons who could do the work, was still out in the boat. Fishing was in his blood. It wasn't just a job, it was a way of life. And Andrew, of course, is the patron saint of fishermen. So these nets also had to do with how they understood, uh, and they, how they and others understood their identities. These nets signified who they were and where they fit in the ancient world. And when Jesus found James and John, they were sitting in the boat with their father, mending their nets. If they and their family were going to eat and make some money, their nets had to be in good repair. Frayed ropes were knotted up, weak spots strengthened. This wasn't just busy work. They weren't just killing time out in the sun. These nets held the promise and hope for their futures. By keeping them in good repair, they were providing security for the future of their families. So wrapped up in these nets that Simon, Andrew, James, and John left behind in the surf were their identities, their livelihoods, their feelings of security, their obligations to their families, everything that was familiar and safe, their whole lives. But when Jesus comes to the lake shore and invites them to follow, they drop those nets that they had tended so carefully, 
that they had mended and made strong and leave them behind to follow him. Clearly, following Jesus meant making huge sacrifices. In Luke's gospel, Jesus tells the crowds that have gathered behind him on the road to Jerusalem that if they wish to follow him, they have to despise their families and loved ones. They have to leave their selves, their selves, their identities and egos behind and be willing to be marked and possibly executed as subversive traitors to the Roman Empire. Because the road that he walked, the road that they had joined him on, leads to the cross. Now the cost of discipleship is different for us today. Now that we're no longer following, literally following an itinerant preacher around the ancient Near East, The call to leave homes and families behind no longer resonates the way it once did. For most of us here in this part of the world, our faith probably won't cost us our lives. But faithful discipleship does still cost us. There are still risks involved. We might still be labeled as subversive for practicing peace and witnessing to God's all-embracing grace and love in a culture that thrives on division, hate, and fear, and violence. Jesus' call to discipleship is still as simple, clear, and compelling as it was 2,000 years ago. Come, follow me. And the response of those who would be disciples is the same. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. What are the nets that Jesus might be asking us to let go of and leave behind if we truly wish to follow him? What are those markers of identity those scaffoldings of safety, security, and certainty that we might have to sacrifice if we are to be bearers of good news? Of course, I can't answer that for you. Because something else this text shows us is that although Jesus' call is simple and clear, it's also incredibly particular speaking to each individual where and as they are. When Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee and met four fishermen, he used language that they would understand in their context. In a fit of clever wordplay, he invited these fishermen to become fishers of men. He didn't arrive on the shore of the sea and talk to these men who smelled like fish with their nets and their boats with images of farming or shepherding as he does elsewhere. He talked to the fishermen as fishermen. He calls each one of us as we are. And the call to discipleship comes to us where we are as we are. So there's no one-size-fits-all image of what discipleship might look like. And so, too, the nets that those first disciples left behind in the sand will mean different things for different people. But I will offer one suggestion. For many of us, identity and feelings of security and safety and order come from an in-group mentality, which typically has at least as much to do with who's out as it does with who's in. We in the church do this all the time, set ourselves apart and separate ourselves from the rest of this world that God created and loves, 
setting ourselves up as arbiters and dispensers of God's grace and justice, deciding who is righteous and worthy enough to be welcomed into God's kingdom and who isn't. I think we need to leave this sort of thinking behind if we're going to follow Christ. Jesus, after all, tears this in-group mentality apart in his life and ministry by reaching out to, welcoming, and caring for people who were excluded and marginalized by the religious people of his time while condemning the religious people for their judgmental hypocrisy. Well, Jesus' call, however we hear and experience it, is still nothing more and nothing less then come, follow me. If we're going to do that, if we're going to follow in his footsteps, walk the road he walked, welcome and care for the people he welcomed and cared for, proclaim and bear witness to the same kingdom of love, justice, and peace, then church, we need to leave some things behind. Jesus comes to us and calls to us where we are, as we are. But the good news, friends, is that he doesn't leave us there. To leave our nets behind and follow this carpenter from Nazareth is to walk into new life and to walk in such a way that every footstep calls into being God's new reality. It can be scary, and it can be unsettling, because we know that following the way Jesus walked does lead to the cross. But we also know, friends, that the cross is never the end of the story. And the way of Jesus leads also to the empty tomb and the fullness of new life in God's reign. So let us leave our nets behind, trusting in the grace and the promise of our Lord, who still calls us to follow. And by the grace of God, may we have the courage to do so. Amen. And friends, I invite you to lift your bodies and your spirits to the Lord. Please rise as you are able as we sing together hymn number 721, Lord, you have come to the lakeshore.
Amen. You may be seated. Friends, we have the joy, the privilege, and the great responsibility to pray with and for one another and for this world. And so I invite you to share any joys or concerns, any needs or requests that you're carrying on your hearts this morning. And when we hear good news, a cause for thanksgiving and celebration, I will say, Lord, for these blessings. And together, let us say, we give you thanks. And when we hear a cause for concern, a place that needs God's healing touch, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy. And together, let us say, hear our prayer. Uh, I will, I'll share one with you all. I got a call this morning uh, from Barbara Goldberg uh, that her sister, Sandy Yeager, uh, was in the hospital uh, for a surgery, and I'm blanking out of what it was. I think it was heart-related, uh, but she had a stroke while she was in the hospital. And so we pray for Sandy, uh, for healing, for wholeness, uh, and for Barb and all of her loved ones for peace and comfort and courage. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And children of God, for what and whom do you pray this morning? <coughs> Nancy. Continued prayers for Barack <coughs> McLean as he has, um, yeah, he has more surgery for mm -hmm. brain cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We pray uh, continued prayers for Ross McLean and uh, prayers of peace and courage for his loved ones, as well as healing and wholeness for him. Uh, as he has another surgery uh, for brain cancer. Lord, be with them all. Wrap them in your care, your compassion, and your protection. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Joe. Yes, thank you, Joe. Ongoing prayers. Uh, for Joe's sister, Jan, who is now in rehab in Lancaster. Lord, we pray uh, for Jan's healing and wholeness, for peace, comfort, and courage for her and all her loved ones on this walk to recovery. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Any others? Yeah, Carolyn, well, then we'll bounce back to Paul. And since, since he may be going home so quickly, send those to the home address rather than the hospital. <laughs> thank you, Carolyn. And thank you for uh, being such a good, caring, uh, supportive deacon and person uh, for their family. Uh, but yes, prayers of gratitude and thanksgiving uh, that Brandon Voderberg's brain surgery on Friday seems to have gone well, and he is... Uh, already recovering well and may be home as early as tomorrow or Tuesday. Um, there will be a second surgery mm. February 23rd. Right. That is a planned surgery mm. and we will just be doing that. Yes, thank you. And there's, yes, uh, so continued prayers also for the second uh, surgery in this uh, fairly long process, but for now, we are grateful that he's doing well and grateful for the care and support and prayers of this church community. Lord, for these blessings, we give you thanks. And Paul. Thank you. And is that nationwide or Cincinnati Children's? Nationwide here, okay. <laughs> well, continued prayers uh, for a young man, Tristan, 
and his mother, whom we have held in our prayers for some time now. Uh, he was on a, a journey of healing and recovery and has been readmitted uh, to Nationwide, so we pray for their peace and courage and comfort, O oh Lord, as well as healing and wholeness for Tristan. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Uh, there's Bob. Oh. Oh. Yes, and the, and his wife passed away. Yes. Thank you. Prayers, uh, prayers for uh, one of uh, many of y'all's uh, colleagues uh, in ushering, Joe Weaver, as his wife passed away from cancer. Uh, she is fine now. We pray for Joe and for all of her loved ones as they journey through the valley of the shadow of grief and loss. May they know comfort and peace, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayer. Any others? Laura. Yeah, continued prayers for Mark Lovinger as she's still battling um, glioma cancer. Um, she made the difficult decision to retire much earlier and under different terms than she had hoped. Yeah. That, um, I hope you're peaceful in that decision and her medical. Yeah, thank you. Continued prayers. Uh, for Laura's friend and colleague, Laura Clevenger, um, who is ganglioma, you said, who is battling ganglioma. Um, and in addition to her uh, medical battle, uh, has had to make some significant life changes, retiring sooner and under different conditions than she had hoped for. And so for her health and for these transitions, Lord, we ask for your comfort, your peace, and your courage to be with Laura. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Are there any others? Oh, Tim. Oh my goodness! Prayers for prayers for Tim's high school classmate, uh, who uh, a little while ago uh, had a growth, found a growth in her brain and uh, swelling, and now they've discovered that she has a type of rare cancer on her her kidney and what a liver, gallbladder. gallbladder thank you, and so we pray for her. And for all of her loved ones, for peace, courage, comfort, healing, and wholeness, Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Oh, and I would also ask uh, for you all to remember in your prayers uh, the, the family of one of my good friends and colleagues in ministry. Uh, his name is Blake Severson. He's serving in Anchorage, Alaska now, and was actually... Tell the old story some other time, uh, but uh, they found out his wife uh, has stage four colon cancer, um, and she's beginning chemotherapy this week. Uh, the, he, I mean, they're about my age, you know, two, uh, two beautiful young daughters. So please keep uh, Megan and Blake and their family in your prayers. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Andy. Prayers for an old Parkview member uh, who lost his wife eight days ago and for their whole family in their time of grief. May they experience the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, in your mercy, you. hear our prayer. And we have confidence and courage to bring all of our prayers, all of our needs, all of our joy, our hurt, our sadness and our anger before God. And with confidence as children of God now, let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Children of God, the Lord calls us to follow Christ exactly as we are, with all that we have and all that we are. And so we're invited to put our gifts in service to the Lord. And you can return an offering or a tithe to God uh, by leaving it in a basket at the back of the sanctuary on your way out, if you didn't, on your way in. And is that right that we have an offertory, a special, a special piece of music here, or are we just doing the doxology? Okay, in gratitude for the gifts we have to share, let us rise in body and in spirit as we are each able. Please stand. As we sing together the Epiphany doxology, you will find printed in your bulletin. Holy God, you call us to be fishers of people. Through these gifts, may the whole world come to know of your redeeming love, your unconditional grace. And by the light that we show, may all people be drawn into that love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able as we sing together hymn number 377, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
Friends, Christ's call to us today is as simple, as clear, as compelling, and yet as challenging as it was 2,000 years ago. Come, follow me. May we leave our nets, ourselves behind, and follow where and as the Savior leads us. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Go now in peace. And may the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love and the power of God our Creator, and the communion and community of the Holy Spirit abide with and sustain you all this day and evermore. Amen.